Alright, welcome back to the channel. You guys have been asking for it, so I'm going to get into it. The Foundry Platform Explained. Uh, understanding AI and ML software, and we'll be going through my impressions of Foundry, uh, how it can be used, how generally these features are used, and why we didn't adopt Foundry, and some suggestions I have for Palantir that can help them win uh, future contracts. So let's get into the key components here. So the key components of any platform we build today to do uh, ML and AI research is data governance, data science, and applications. And these things absolutely flow in the directions that arrows are showing. And each one of them is made up of several key pillars, right? And Foundry is no exception. Uh, it, within data governance, generally, you have data producers, which are made up of like data pipelines and, and storage systems and You'll have often materialized views of pipelines, which are things like um, aggregating data into maybe time series or some other aggregate view that you need to see it. In, and that's produced in real time as the data comes in, in most cases today. You have data owners who are responsible for data quality and access and catalogs, uh, essentially govern uh, who gets what uh, from the, the data catalog. And then you have data consumers, right? And those are like your scientists and your analysts out there who are actively using this data to help, the, help organizations make uh, decisions. And uh, within the, the sort of data science realm, uh, you have like the data engineering, which is like, how do we, how do we most effectively store this data and um, architect it so that it's most usable by common query engines? And a good example of that is optimizing partitions for Spark or something. You know, what is the optimal partition size so that Spark queries are efficient? So you have like data engineering that goes on there. You have feature engineering where we're trying to find out the neat relationships in the data, finding how things relate uh, and, and gaining a deep understanding of, of our data so that we can effectively uh, model it, right? And so you also have traditional analytics, uh, you know, Tableau use cases and things like that. Uh, you have the actual modeling where, where data scientists are creating models after they've performed feature engineering to sort of see if we can um, make interesting predictive assertions, right? And then we also have scoring. This is often overlooked, but, but data scientists have to assign some confidence level. Typically, we're going to assign some confidence level to our models and sort of how, how, how psyched are we on this version of the model and should it be deployed to production, that sort of thing. Um, and then you also have your application layer. Right and CI/CD, which is like continuous integration and deployment. Um, those are separate things, but but basically, when you make changes to your models or to your data or to your code, it has to be integrated. And then, when especially when you make model changes to your models that need to be deployed, those they need an automated way to deploy that. And then you have application monitoring, right? We need to we need to have our telemetry data. We need to know how things are working in production. If there's model degradation, we need, we want to know about it. Um, which also touches on security and alerting. Um, you know, we want to make sure that if something's going wrong in production, that, that the appropriate people are notified. And then your availability, right? Like how scalable are those endpoints? How scalable are the models? Are, are they able to handle the traffic load? Is your system up and guaranteed up at the, you know, per your SLA, right? So those are all the, the platforms. And, and Foundry absolutely supports every single one of those use cases. And it supports it in a stunning way, like way better than I thought it could right um it is literally dozens if not hundreds of products in one you know i when i when i saw foundry um it appeared like it just literally supported every product i've ever seen which was amazing um this this platform is incredible it's literally every data source i could imagine every use case we just went over every tool every popular industry tool from from snowflake to databricks to all of your standard cloud providers, to standard relational relational databases, ERP, CRM, it, it basically supports everything. And uh, it's also got complete security, right? So like nothing that they've done overlooked security at all. In fact, it's, it's probably the most well-defined set of controls and, and sort of most secure platform out of the box I've ever seen. So uh, Foundry is absolutely incredible. Um, and it really is the big data OS. When we talk about what is the big data OS, if you watch my original video, Palantir's Value Explained, and I showed how Palantir was going to unify all of these things, that is the big data OS. It's how do you bring together all of these tools and all of these data sources into one unified platform that can support 
the modern organization. And Foundry is absolutely that. And, and Foundry can enable the future, right? So like, what's interesting about Foundry is that it, it is already being tooled up to support blockchain technology, in particular like cryptocurrency transactions and understanding transaction data and fraud. And that's gonna be a key point as organizations sort of build business consortiums that use digital contracts to execute um, essentially agreements between themselves and start trading in cryptocurrency as opposed to dollars. So like it, it was organizations you know, decide to, to sort of operate in a more autonomous way through digital contracts and using AI and ML to surface signal data to execute those contracts, probably the way, the most likely way they're going to transact value is through cryptocurrency, in my opinion. And Palantir is really set up, I mean, Foundry is really set up to enable this sort of, not only like uh, business structure, but the, the transactions between the businesses. Uh, and it also is amazing at security, like I said before, and that really plays a big role when you start getting into KYC and into being able to assert who this this entity or person says they are, like that assertion, being able to validate that assertion, but do it in a decentralized way, which is the hard part of this. That is, you know, when people talk about Web 3.0 or or um, decentralized applications, that decentralization of that is is super hard, and I believe that that um, Palantir is on the cutting edge of enabling that future decentralization, and they know it. They totally know it. They they have this. It's their secret. I think it's their insight into the the future is that the future is decentralized. Um, so, and also the future is low code or no code. And Foundry definitely empowers non technical users. I'm not you know telling you guys anything you probably haven't heard before, but Palantir does have some really amazing or Foundry does have some really amazing no to low code features built in, and I I really believe that that's the people who don't code, the people who are unable to do the engineering, that's the vast majority of, of decision makers in an organization. And so if we look at today, we, we definitely have a bottleneck, you know, like the data is coming in at an astounding rate, but engineering is absolutely the bottleneck, you know, putting that data through the, um, all of the technical machinery that has to get it to a point where you can make a decision on it, that really slows down and hinders organizations. And in a lot of ways, like insightful models are really going to be a commodity, I think, in the future, like because we're all making models that are basically, you know, in the same category, they maybe they need to be tuned to your particular data set. I think that in the future, you know, the the model is the commodity, the science is the commodity, and really it's the platform that enables that the use of those models that's the winner and it's, it's where we get to in the future where we just go from data to decisions. We don't have to necessarily go through all of the work we do today. And Foundry absolutely is on the, in my opinion, on the cutting edge of that. I think they have the best low code, no code solution out there. Um, but why didn't, so why didn't we purchase Foundry, right? Like this is a tough one. Um, you know, for, to me, it's, is that there's this really this DIY mindset out there in the industries. And it really reminds me of like sort of the late nineties, early two thousands when like, everyone in IT was all about rolling their own data centers, you know, like that was, oh man, we're going to roll our own. We're not going to co-locate oh, with the cloud. What the hell is the cloud? <laughs> it's like, um, I, and, and the cloud, honestly, it didn't come around more till like 2010, really, when people started um, really adopting the cloud. So maybe even a little after, um, but, but it really reminds me right now, like the IT departments, they want to take all of the open source technology and they want to use AWS and they want to kind of roll their own foundry platform. But what's interesting about that is that this is like a multi-year process. Like I've said this before numerous times on the channel, like that's a two to three year process to get it to where it actually delivers any kind of business value. And it's really shocking to me that, um, you know, decision makers and organizations on the technology side don't recognize how risky of an endeavor that is. And like, why wouldn't you want to just take the boost now and get into the, and be competitive now rather than two to three years from now, just because, I don't know, like it, maybe it's a, um, an ego thing, like putting these things together somehow, you know, makes you a better engineer or like it's you're, you're, you're standing out among your peers because you're competing with what they're doing. You're not just like taking a shortcut or something. I don't know. <clears throat> I don't know, but it does really remind me of that mindset of the early 2000s. So Palantir is really going to have to figure out how to win this build versus buy debate. And that doesn't get easier when you push down market. Um, you know, I, I think that winning the build versus divide by debate in larger organizations is really a key of the executive leadership uh, or is, is like something you can solve with at the executive leadership level. Whereas as you push down market, you're dealing with smaller organizations. Uh, this problem is, is generally compounded. Um, people don't necessarily 
understand high level business decision making at the level they do say in the global 2000s uh, or in the global 2000 so you know uh, the, the Palantir really needs to figure out how they're going to deal with this and um, in, in my opinion I have some recommendations right so like the first one is Alex Carp executive golf pro right so like I remember that back in the day what cut through what really enabled uh, a lot of AWS adoption, at least at the higher levels, and especially like Azure and GCP is like, let's get the CEOs together for a round of golf, right? <laughs> let's, let's get the people who actually make decisions together and cut through the bullshit and really explain the value proposition over a round of golf and some drinks maybe, you know? And, and honestly, I think this is where if, if they want to make big headwinds in the global 2000 or in really large organizations, they're probably doing this, you know, they definitely didn't do this with us. We're a small company. Uh, but but I think that that's where we've got to cut through the bullshit and and Carp's got to get really good at explaining exactly like in clear terms, not like dancing around swaying side to side, dancing around in lofty language and, and quoting Hegel. No, you need to like clearly and warmly explain the value proposition of this platform and how it can help your customer or your potential customer. So I, I think that that's something that could really um, help them advance and win this bill versus buy debate and and focus on startups which they're doing that's great but i think that's where aws made the vast majority of its headwinds because that's where the value proposition is strongest because startups didn't have the money to build a data center you know it was just off the table right away and by enabling them to get past that hurdle and go straight to code you know or relatively straight to code um you know it's a huge huge boost i mean that, that was like oh my god we can get back by on a fraction of the money in half the time and that's really, I think, something they've got to focus on is somehow getting into these startups and, and focusing on that. Uh, but the way you do that is to democratize Foundry. You know, you got to build a developer community. You've got to have training set up that anyone can access. You got to have, you know, provide onboarding on the website. So I don't have to like, you know, go through an upfront sales process. Like I should just be able to sign up and start using this thing. There should be quick start guides, getting started guides. And you should be investing by holding developer conferences, going around city to city, holding, you know, just like Databricks does. I've been to plenty of Databricks conferences and they warmly welcome you there and they get you started with their platform. They'll even certify you at the conference, right? So like, they absolutely have to start doing this. They are gonna lose 100% if they don't start doing this like right away. And can the secrecy bullshit, okay? Like there's nothing that I, I don't believe there's anything that they would give away um, by no, by just being open. Um, I'm not sure why they're so secretive. It scares me as an investor that they are a little secretive because it's it's like why are you secretive? The platform looks amazing. Um, you know, like why wouldn't you want people to see this? It's not like you're giving away national secrets or something. But like that is a little scary and and so i think that they should you know just for the sake of the investment community too, can the secrecy crap and and get this in the hands of people um and have an onboarding process through the website and it doesn't you don't have to refactor your technology you know like slack has onboarding through their website but it's often the provisioning looks a lot probably like foundry does they just need to automate the provisioning process so for me, like that's an absolute must. Um, so yeah, these are my recommendations of what I, what I think they could do to sort of win that build versus to buy debate based on our experience going through the, the the process. And so, but why can Foundry win too? This was something I was thinking of, and I've been thinking a lot about this lately. Like I wrote an article back in 2020 criticizing AWS and it's like sheer lack of, it, it's horrible developer experience, it's overlapping services, and it's, largely worse than services that are just focused on this or companies that are focused on just this one aspect. And here's some good examples, right? So like AWS Cognito is an identity and authorization platform, but so is AuthO. And AuthO, is, that's all they do. They just do identity and authorization. And it's amazing. And the developer experience is incredible. And AWS Cognito is a pile of dog shit. And the developer experience is terrible. And that is the, the same thing with virtually every AWS service like DocumentDB. DocumentDB is just a copy of MongoDB, except the platform experience of actually having to use the platform on AWS is worse than MongoDB. MongoDB is amazing. MongoDB Atlas was the best, probably the best platform I've ever used to provision a document database and manage it in production. And I love MongoDB. I think the, I think they're, um, 
that database is the most versatile application database out there. And, and I, I've used it for years, I've loved it. Um, it doesn't do everything, but it does everything that an app would need, to need right? So uh, it's not to be the only database in your stack, but the point is, is that MongoDB is focused on this one use case, right? Their Atlas platform is focused on this one thing, whereas like DocumentDB and Cognito and SageMaker they're all just these little little sort of siloed groups in AWS, and they largely run into each other, and they never produce a good developer experience. And this is where AWS could really, I think Amazon eventually will have to like spin off, um, you know, AWS into a separate company, and maybe, you know, take their best services and make them standalone companies so they can focus on just those things. But this is why Foundry can win, because Palantir is, this company's focused on one thing, and that's the big data OS, which, does compete with AWS SageMaker Studio, but is so much better. <laughs> you know, like I, I don't even see it as competition because like it's almost like apples and oranges comparison given how advanced Foundry is. So like, you know, there's there is um, there's a real big reason they can win, right? But I think this is the key insight in my mind is that a Palantir cloud is basically a must, right? Because AWS is just a fucking clown car show, you know, like trying to put all these pieces of their jigsaw puzzle into some usable use case that you can barely keep running for the reasons I just stated, right? <laughs> like they're the way they build their products, yes, they're customer focused, but they're not they're not well engineered and from the standpoint of the developer. And and like if Palantir could launch its own cloud, that is the future of business. It's literally this, you know, basically operating system and it's easy to provision everything and it's you get the use cases you need right out of the box you don't have to sit there and write all this infrastructure as code and like deal with fucking IAM permissions and everything else that goes into like making anything run on AWS <laughs> and it, it it would be incredible it would crush it it would crush AWS I mean this is the real opportunity that I see in Foundry that I see in Palantir when I say that they're going to have like a trillion dollar TAM at some point this is going into that because it's not just what AI so the AI software market is going to be. It's this is like in Peter Thiel's book Zero to One where he talks about like what is the real TAM? You know, he talks about like is it is it just this one use case or is it really this broader TAM? And and like this is really where we're at I think with with Palantir and people aren't realizing is that the TAM also includes cloud, right? It also includes AI software. But it's also just going to include like normal things that you wouldn't think of, you know, like identity on identity to do things like apply for loan applications. And it will be things where you have you want to deploy models to every client device out there, every IoT you know application possible. That cloud, Palantir Cloud, can address like things that just no one else can do today, like Apollo being able to deploy out to the edge that is going to be the future of AI. Like every model we're deploying now, like we really look to client side first. We're really trying to get away from anything that has to go out to hit a model endpoint. It's just so much more efficient to have your apps work directly with a model that you've built when it's on the device. And Apollo is really well positioned to just kick the crap out of everything out there, in my opinion, based, you know, and, and so like a Palantir cloud that brings all this stuff together and really builds the modern operating system for business would just freaking destroy everything out there. So like, yeah, for me, that's, um, that, that's something like is a key insight based on my experience with the platform and, and sort of where I see things going. So, yeah, I mean, and again, this is just me, you know, I'm not speaking on behalf of Palantir or any of the people there. These are my impressions, my thoughts. So, so take with it what you will. But uh, in my opinion, this, this platform is just the shit, so.